going to continue in our series called Rediscover Church. A few weeks ago, we joined together with churches all over our country, and uh, we celebrate Back to Church Sunday. Back to Church Sunday, and that's just one of those Sundays where it gives us an opportunity to invite those people who may not have been in church for a while, or maybe those who are a little disgruntled uh, with church, you know, and, um, and uh, just an opportunity to invite them back. And my hope through this series uh, is to uh, uh, just um, maybe foster a place where we can fall in love all over again, not only with Jesus, uh, but with His church. Church, with his church. As long as we're here on this earth, uh, you know, his church is the embassy. His church is, um, you know, where, where it's at. <laughs> not just this building, but us. We are, know ye not that ye are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And so we won't need church uh, or to just be church all the time, I guess. We won't need church when we get to heaven. So now's our opportunity, amen, for church. And so uh, my hope is that we would get those maybe who haven't been in a while to rediscover church. Those of us who come all the time, there are times, can I just admit something to you? And I know I'm up here, you know, giving a message and the pastor and all of those kind of things. But if I was just going to be 100% honest with you, there are times when I don't feel like coming to church. Yeah, I heard this old joke one time where a guy was, uh, you know, in his, in his room and it was time to go to church. And his wife said, come on, it's time to go to church. He said, I don't want to go today. I don't feel like going. And she said, you have to go. And he said, why? She said, because you're the pastor. You know, so you, you have to go to church. And so, um, you know, just like anything else, there's times, uh, you know, when we, when we feel down or we're tired, we're spiritually tired. We get all of those things. And so um, now is an opportunity for us to rediscover the joys of church and the benefits of church. And when I say church, I know that we are the church. Who's the church? We are the church. I know it. Jesus is in us. We are the church. But coming together as he mandated us to do, there's something about, that's why we have corporate prayer. You know, there's something about us taking some time out, even if it's only for a few moments, to just pray together in one place. You know, when the Holy Spirit fell at, uh, on the day of Pentecost, the Bible specifically says they were together on one accord, together on one accord, and then they received the Holy Spirit and mighty things happened. So there's something about us coming together as a church, amen, and uh, worshiping together, sharing together, fellowshipping together, all of those things. And so we're trying to, to get to that place where we rediscover church. And I think for us who are in church, we have to remind ourselves that all people need Jesus. All people need church. Now, I know everyone in here would probably agree with that. You would, you would amen that. You would say, yes, I, you know, I agree with you, you know, Brother Mike, you know, all people need Jesus. Uh, but living it out in our life is a different thing altogether sometimes. You know, we have things in our mind. We, we prejudge. I'm, and I'm not judging you. I'm just saying it's the human way. It's the human condition. Um, you know, when we don't have our mind on Jesus uh, 100% of the time, there are times when we look at people and we we, we judge and we stereotype and we, we do all of those things. It's, it's the human mind. All of us do those things. And so we have to remind ourselves that all people need Jesus, just not people who are like you or people who receive from you. Or like I said last week, vice versa. Some of us feel like, well, the people who are intelligent and educated, I'm not going to talk to them. I'm going to talk to the desolate. You know, they need Jesus. And it's true, they do. But everyone does. You know, the scholar needs Jesus just like the pauper needs Jesus. Amen. Amen. All people need Jesus and God uses ordinary people in everyday places uh, to help people just like you and me. Our thinking, our actions, our hearts have to be aligned to Jesus in order for us to represent the church that people need to rediscover. Perhaps people don't rediscover church sometimes because the church is not something that they deem to uh, be rediscovered. <laughs> you know, it's not something that they want to rediscover. All right. And so we have to make the church discoverable for people to rediscover the church. Amen. So I'm going to talk a little bit about divine appointments. I'll get into that a little bit more next week. Uh, but what gives us the power, it's interesting that we sang the songs we sang today. Uh, the Holy Spirit, you know, had us change some things around even this morning and, um, and Carla knows. And so um, it's interesting that, you know, the, God is leading us this way. God knows what he's doing uh, because we're going to talk a little bit about the power of the Holy Spirit. 
this morning, okay? And it's not spooky. I won't keep you too too long, but it's it's not a spooky thing. It's not, you know, uh, you know, we I came up through uh, like some of you, many of you, maybe, you know, they, they we we call these things different movements. You know, there was a Pentecostal movement, a charismatic movement, a Jesus movement. I've even heard the term faith movement, which actually I understand what it means, but it's kind of a ridiculous saying. And I say that only because uh, it's always faith. There's no movement of faith. It's from Genesis to Revelation, you know, it's faith. The just shall live, uh, walk, move, have our being by faith. We can't please God without faith. So I can't be a faith movement. We just must always have faith. You're saved by faith. By grace, you are saved through faith, not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. So, but I remember all the, you know, all the movements, the charismatic movements and the gifts of the spirit movements and, you know, all of these things. And right now we have to be able to discern the times, church. And I said at the beginning of this series that we, as as we look at the church and as we rediscover the church of Jesus Christ and what he wants it to be, it may not be the church that we, we think it should be. It may not be the church service. Uh, it may not go the way that we think it should go or what we're used to. It could be something totally different altogether. We have to be able to discern the times that we're in. You know, Jesus told Israel, he said, listen, uh, don't miss now, I'm paraphrasing, don't miss the time. You're, you're, you're missing the time that I'm with you. Don't miss the time that I'm with you. And, and you see, we get used to a certain thing, so we think that's how it's always supposed to be. You have to understand the times that we're in, church. Now, uh, there's, you know, there is what? Social media, all kind of media. People are, you know, there's information everywhere, and there's education quote unquote education. I'll just say information. People feel like they're getting educated from so many different ways. I mean, you know, from the from the birth of Facebook and Twitter and, uh, and now Instagram and, and, and young people are snapping each other and uh, on TikTok. And there's just so many ways to get information out. And so people are looking for something a little bit more than what we think of as revival. Now, I know this might rub some of you the wrong way because we sang a song this morning, Lord, we need you. We need the, the you know, it was old school. My wife sang it, the Holy Ghost, all right? Holy Spirit, we need you. We do need, I'm not saying that we don't need a revival, but if we're going to win people to Christ, we must discern the time that we're in. And, it, and, and, and people, it's not going to impress people when they come in and they see what we call a, a move of God. That's going to be for us. We need that. We need that for us to be able to wake up. But to win people to Christ, our life must shine. Our life must show. There must be evidence in our life. It can't be because, listen, people have information. People are, are educated even more so than they've ever been and all of those things. And it's not that we are, um, you know, changing ourselves or lowering some standards to meet the people. But Jesus always met people where they were. That's why he went over Mark's or Matthew's house and uh, what I call a Matthew party. He went to dinner with sinners. And before that, you would have never heard of a priest or a Pharisee going to dinner with sinners. But Jesus Jesus came on the scene and that's what he did. Why? Because he met people where they are. It may not look like uh, the temple and what you're used to, right? This is a different time. And as the church, we must do whatever it takes. As long as we're not lowering any standards when it comes to the word of God, we must do whatever it takes to win people to Christ. Because if we ever needed the Lord before, we sure do need him now. We sure do need him now. And so we must first look at ourselves and listen, we have the power to do these things. We have the power to overcome. We have the power to witness. And that power is in the person, watch this now, not something, but in the person of the Holy Spirit. And I want to talk this morning just for a couple more minutes about rediscovering the Holy Spirit in us right? Maybe not what we're used to. Maybe not the spooky thing of us floating around and speaking in tongues and nothing wrong with tongue. Paul said, I speak in tongues more than you all. And you know, all you, you guys know those things. So no, I'm not downing any of those things. I'm just saying that to rediscover the Holy Spirit, it's all of it. It's all of it. And see, 
Really, we talk about, we argue about these things like tongues and signs and wonders. Uh, Jesus said, signs and wonders shall follow. We need signs and wonders. Please, uh, you know, don't mistake what I'm saying uh, about signs and wonders and speaking in tongues and all of those things. I believe in all of it. But you really want to know how the Holy Spirit is shown and how we're going to win people uh, with the Holy Spirit. Something that cannot be duplicated. Healing can be duplicated. You know, the enemy can, 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 can make something look like healing or make something look like it's it's God. You know, signs and wonders can be duplicated. You know what can't be duplicated is the fruit of the Spirit, right? If, if I pick an apple off a tree, I know what kind of tree it is. I don't have to guess, is it a pear tree? Is it really trying to fool me? No, because a pear tree doesn't produce apples. Only an apple tree does. And so it's the fruit of the Spirit that we, and that, you know what that is? That, that means that our life is showing the Holy Spirit of God. Our life is showing, and there's evidence of it in our life, okay? There's evidence of it in our life. I think that the world and people see us, and they, they, they see us praying, and they see us uh, crying out, and, and then they don't see changes. They still see, you know, all of these, uh, you know, issues in politics and, and social, uh, you know, social justice or whatever it is, and the economy, and, uh, you know, all, all of the things, and, and COVID-19, and they see all these things, and they're saying, well, the church keeps praying, but, uh, you know, nothing's changing, so why should I go to the church? And I think that we, as the church, church have to first look at ourselves and look at what Jesus did. You know, Jesus, Jesus didn't always pray for the sick. I know it messes you up, doesn't it? This is the, wait a minute now. Hold on. What church did I come to? I mean, what's his pastor talking about? He didn't always pray for the sick. Go, go back and read it. Look at it. Read it for yourself. Every gospel. He, he usually told them something to do. He usually spoke. He spoke to it. He spoke to it. Do this. Even in the Old Testament, uh, what was it? Elijah, Elisha told Naaman to go dip uh, seven times. You know, he didn't pray for him. And Naaman was looking, see, this is where we are. We're naming because we're looking uh, for prayer. We want somebody to lay hands on us and we want prayer. And God is saying, go do this. Be obedient to my word and you'll be healed. But we're saying, no, no, no. Would you just go tell me to do something? Pray for me. See? And, and, and God is saying, look, I'm telling you to be obedient to my word. And so Jesus spoke to it. We need to start speaking the stuff. That's why I spoke. We need to start speaking. I mean, do you have faith or not? We need to start speaking to some things. And it's not a magic thing. It's, this is the word of God, speaking his word. Not just speaking what we want to speak. We got to speak the word of God. Speak the word of God. It's going to be changed. The world is going to be changed by the word of God, the true word of God. Jesus is the only one, the only one who stood up in front of people and said, I am the way, the way, not a way, not a kind of a way. He said, I am the way. I am the truth, the only truth. There is no truth unless it comes from Jesus. And I am the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. But to get that across to educated people, our life is going to have to show that. We can't just say that in a minute and, and expect them to believe it. Right? Why? Because, listen, you say, well, hold on, Brother Mike, you know, we get into a service, you know, like this, and the music starts playing, and, and the Holy Spirit is moving, and all of those things happen. People can't help but believe in God. And I want to tell you another thing. Listen, I, I, I'm not trying to mess up your theology this morning, but I'm telling you, you know, people who are educated, say that, will, that will work. That will work for some people, but some people who, you know, feel like anyway they're educated, and they, you know, they want information, they may say, that's good for you, but I didn't feel anything. Why? And it's, the reason why is because deep speaks to deep. If they're not saved and not filled with the Holy Spirit, they're not feeling the same things that you feel. They're not getting the same revelations that you get, okay? They're not getting those things. And just because you get it doesn't mean they are. We have to go the extra mile. See, Jesus said, I didn't come for the well. I came for the sick. And I'm going to do anything that I need to do to get to them, even if that's going to Matthew's house and sitting with sinners, even if that's letting a prostitute cry tears and wash my feet, even if that's washing your feet and I created you. He'll do whatever it takes to get you to understand his love for you. And that's what we must do as the church. And we have something called the Holy Spirit that allows us to do that. See, over in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16, the Bible says this. It says, do you not know that you are the temple of God 
and that the Spirit of God dwells in you. We would know that scripture. Many of us would know that scripture. Some of you know the King James, know ye not that ye are the temple of the Holy Ghost. All right. Some of you know the NIV. Some of you know, but we know it. Do you not know that the Holy Spirit dwells in you and you are the temple? We don't have to go to a place uh, to find God and to find the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit dwells in you. You have the Holy Spirit. That's why you're an overcomer. And the reason is because in John 14, 16, Jesus prayed. He said, I pray the the Father, that he will give you another helper, that he may abide with you forever. And so we, what we have to realize is the Holy Spirit is always with us. When you're on the mountaintop, the Holy Spirit is with you. When you're in the valley, the Holy Spirit is with you. When you're doing great things and good things for people, the Holy Spirit is with you. When you're falling short, not thinking as you should, and even commit a sin, guess what? The Holy Spirit is there. And that shouldn't be a scary thing. He already knew you were going to do it. He already knew, and he decided to be with you anyway, knowing what you would do, knowing what you would go through. That's actually comforting. That's why he's the great comforter. Back in Ezekiel eleven nineteen, it says, Then I will give them how many hearts? One heart. One heart, and I will put a new spirit within them and take the stony heart out of their flesh and give them a heart of flesh. That means a heart that's soft and pliable, ready to receive my word. A heart of compassion and a heart of empathy. And I think, side note, I think as the church, one of the things that we need to do, we, we may even pride ourselves, uh, sounds kind of, um, you know, uh, odd. We may even pride ourselves on compassion and being compassionate. But I think there's a moment in our lives, church, where we're going to have to push past compassion to empathy. They're two different things. We're going to have to put ourselves in the place of people that don't know Jesus, and when we do that, now we can validate their concerns. We can validate, uh, you know, their questions. We can't be afraid. I know me as a person who grew up in church and who's fully persuaded and all of those things. You know, if someone were to come to me 10 years ago and say, well, I just don't know. I don't know. I mean, there's a lot of things out there. You know, there's this people talking about Allah and then, you know, Buddha has a lot of good things to say and Confucius had a lot of good things to say and the Hindus and I just don't know what's right. I would have been like, whoa, wait a minute now. No, no, no. You, it, 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 that's frightening me. You got, it's Jesus. It's only Jesus. You know, and I would have been afraid of that as if God can't take care of himself. Okay. It would, it would have worried me. Today, it doesn't worry me. In fact, I think God welcomes that. God welcome. You got any questions? Ask me. Don't be in the dark. Don't, 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 don't. <laughs> I, I probably shouldn't say this. Most of you won't know this. Maybe a couple, maybe my wife. There used to be this old song by this group called The Emotions. And the song was, don't ask my neighbor, ask me. You know, it's about this guy who liked the girl and he would always ask other people instead of asking her. And they, they said, don't ask my neighbor, ask me. God is saying that. Listen, don't ask my neighbor, ask me. I, I know, I can tell you, I have the answer for you if you would seek me. And, and his shoulders are big enough to take every question that someone that doesn't believe in him or that may believe in him but's not sure, any questions, his shoulders are big enough for that. And if his shoulders are big enough for that, then we have to stop being so defensive with these questions. We have to welcome him and say, hey, that's, you know what, it's, that's a valid question. Because if, you, if you're not saved, you're not filled with the Holy Spirit and all of those things, of course, I would have the same questions. And I would hope that someone would spend time with me, listen to my concerns, okay, and not shun me away. And then also tell me the truth, okay, but then allow me to discover for myself once they give me the truth, the truth about God, okay? That's what the Holy Spirit who's in you is working through you. Even over in Titus, it said, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us through the washing of, watch this now, regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. Regeneration, that describes a spiritual birth and only the Holy Spirit can do that. So the first thing we have to realize is that the Holy Spirit is in you. You have the Holy Spirit. You have the Holy Spirit already. The Holy Spirit is in you. He is in you. Everywhere that you go, the Holy Spirit is in you. You don't have to be afraid. You don't have to be afraid of questions. Uh, you don't have to be afraid of confrontation. You don't have to be confrontational. You don't have to be any of those things. Don't be afraid because you have the Spirit of God in you. 
And, and if, God, if the Spirit of God is in you, understand this. Understand, number two, that the Holy Spirit fills you. And you might say, all right, you know, Brother Mike, that's, that's the same thing. The Holy Spirit is in you. The Holy Spirit fills you. But let me tell you what I mean by the Holy Spirit fills you. To be filled is, uh, is, is, is an expansion of our capacity for everything, for worshiping, for witnessing. You know, filling means that it's all the way up to the brim. Filling means to put as much in as can be held contained, supply with fullness to the top, to the brim. That means there can be nothing else in there. You want to know how to live a holy life? It's not how you dress. Come on. It's not your vernacular or your vocabulary living a holy life. And in fact, it's not committing a righteous acts 24 hours a day, right? Can't do that anyway. You got to sleep sometime. But it's, you know, to, to live a holy life is simply be filled, be filled, filled, filled with the Holy Spirit. Then there's room for nothing else. If there's any area in our life where we fall short, and I say every week, I'm looking in a mirror. Come on. We're, we're all humans. All right. When we, where we fall short in areas of our life is simply because there is room there for something else besides the Holy Spirit. There was room there. And so what does that mean? Is that a condemnation? Of course not. Uh, uh, God knows. God knows us. That's why Paul said this. Paul said, I, I think in Romans, he said, I die daily. Every day. He knows it. Every day you must die daily. That's why we must read our word daily and we must have a prayer life where we pray daily. We must do these, do these things daily because God knows us and he knows that, listen, there are times in our life when we allow other things to come in. That's why James reminds us, don't give place to the devil. And that's what we do. We give place to the devil. Not a condemnation. It's just a reminder that we must, again, every time you wake up, why you think God said, David said, your mercies are new. New, new. Not the same mercy. I'm not just giving you one mercy, one forgiveness, and then whenever you do something, call on that mercy. No, they're new. I give you a brand new mercy every single morning. Every morning. And his mercy endures forever because we're humans. <laughs> it's not an excuse either. We must do the work of being filled every day. Acts 2, 4 says, and they were filled with the Holy Spirit. Filled. Then they began to speak with other tongues and all of those things happened. And Acts 1, 8, but you shall receive power from on high when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be witnesses. You can't even witness properly without being filled with the Holy Spirit. We got to get this. We can't be afraid of the Holy Spirit. Think that's for them crazy Pentecostal people. That's for those crazy charismatics. No, the Holy Spirit is the Holy Spirit. People made things weird. That's people. Blame that on people. They, they've done that, okay? Uh, but God, the Holy Spirit, listen, in Genesis 1, it, it says that the, the Spirit of God hovered over the deep. So the Spirit is nothing new and it's nothing weird, okay? Filled, 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 okay? And then number three, the Holy Spirit frees you. You are free in God when you have the Holy Spirit. You know, at most every other religion, there, is, there are things that you have to do to be part of it. We talked about this before. You have to do, you have to live up to some expectations or you have to perform some acts of penance or you have to go see a priest. I don't want to, you know, I'm not trying to offend you, but you got to go see, see a priest, uh, you know, if, if you want to get forgiveness. And then you got to say four Hail Marys and three Our Fathers. I've been there. I'm not speaking about something I don't know about. I was Catholic first grade through fifth grade, went to mass every Sunday, went to a church called the Holy Spirit Center on, uh, on uh, Sunday, went to Mass every Wednesday, went to the Holy Spirit Center on Sunday. So it was a crazy time in my life, my, you know, first five years of elementary. I didn't know who God was or what he was talking about because he was crazy on Sunday and he was doing some chants Latin, in Latin on Wednesday. And I didn't know who this, this person was, right? And so I get it. I do. I get, I get all of that. Uh, but, you know, with, with Christ and you have the Holy Spirit in you, you are free. 2 Corinthians 3, 7, the Lord is the Spirit. Another side note, the Holy Spirit is in you. The Holy Spirit fills you. And this scripture right here says, the Lord is the Spirit. God is the Spirit that is in you. The Father is in you. Jesus is in you. His Spirit that's in you is Him. 
All right, I'm not preaching a doctrine. I'm not preaching oneness or trinity. I'm just telling you what the Bible says. That's all I'm telling you. Figure that out for yourself. I know for now we see through a glass darkly, uh, but then we shall see face to face. I get it. We don't understand all of it and how it works, but he's God. We don't understand him. How can the universe be in God? How can he create everything? I don't know all of the answers to those things, but I do know that the Lord is that spirit. And the Lord, if the Spirit is in you, the Lord is in you. He's not out there somewhere. And it says, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. There is liberty. You are free. If the Spirit is in you, you are free. You are no longer bound, okay? He frees you. And then number four, the Holy Spirit of God energizes you. As I said, there are times we're in these bodies where we get worn down, right? And even spiritually sometimes. I don't know. Don't raise your hand. But anybody ever been in a spiritual dry place, right? Maybe you don't want to admit it. Uh, and it's just kind of one of those things where I feel like I'm not doing anything wrong, but I'm not hearing from, from God or I, I just don't, I don't feel like praying all the time, you know, or whatever it may be. You're, you're in a, a, a dry land. And listen, God, he, he doesn't want you to be in a dry land, but he's not afraid of it. And in fact, he loves it when you're in a dry land because he says, I can, I'm water in a dry and thirsty land. Yeah, I, I love it when you get to a dry land and you turn to me because here I come like a flood of water to quench your thirst. You know, God is like that. I used to love those old movies, those old cowboy movies, believe it or not. Uh, I, you know, I, I was so young that I wouldn't watch the whole movie, you know, because I get bored when I was that young. It wasn't cartoon, so, you know, uh, there was no Acme thing, and, you know, the Wile E. Coyote wasn't falling off the cliff, so it didn't keep my attention. But I love the part when the lady got tied up, you know, and uh, they tied her up in ropes and put her on the train track. I don't know why they would do that, but they put her on this train track, you know, and then the train was coming, and you say, oh, man, this lady's dead. This train is going to run her over. Then all of a sudden, way in the back, you hear that. And then, oh, coming over the hill, here comes, here comes the cavalry. Uh, I could say cavalry, but here comes cavalry. They come in and they got the flag. They got the banner, Jehovah Nisi. They got the banner coming over. And here they come to save the day. Do you know your God loves to come in and save the day? Why do you think he let Paul and Silas stay in jail until midnight? And at midnight, come on, uh, and at midnight, they started praising and praying God. And here come God, like an earthquake, just shaking stuff up. God loves to do that. So you're never too far away. I don't care how far you're down, how much people have talked about you, what kind of hole you've dug for yourself. Come on. All right. At times in your life, it, it, you know, if you call on God, he loves to come over that hill like the cavalry. Come on and save the day. He is a hero. All right. He can sit down with the Avengers and tell them some things about being a hero, saving the day. Come on. So the Holy Spirit energizes you. It gives you power. It gives you life. He gives you life to keep on going. And then the Holy Spirit with energizing you empowers you. This is that Genesis 1 uh, verse 2 I was talking about where it says the earth was void and without form and darkness was on the face of the deep and the spirit of the Lord was hovering over the face of the deep. You know what I think of? I, I know I'm a, I'm a weird person, you know, and um, so I, I grew up at a time I was little, I was an adult, but I, I used to watch, you know, Star Wars and, and all of those kind of things. And I, I used to love it uh, when Star Wars came on. I know you're like, what, what is he talking about? But I used to love it when the, when the movie came on and they'd be showing in outer space after they do those words, you know, um, and they, you know, I mean, for us, and they, then they show outer space and it'd be all quiet. Then all of a sudden this big giant ship rrr, come right over the top, you know, it's like, whoa, where'd that thing come from? You know, that's the way I imagine it. I imagine the deep was just quiet. You know, the waters were like that maybe, and, and nothing was happening. All of a sudden here comes the Lord mm, hovering over the deep. You know, it's the spirit of God. God is powerful. This is the almighty God. God we're talking about. I think the, the forest shook and the, and the water started shaking as God came over like some, you know, big spaceship. I know it's weird uh, comparing God to a spaceship, but, you know, that's just, that's just what's in my weird mind. But he, you know, God is powerful and that same spirit is in you and that spirit is the Lord. That same spirit that comes in and shakes stuff up. That same spirit that comes in and brings life. 
That same spirit that comes in and brings love. That same spirit that comes in and brings hope. That same spirit that comes in and re-energizes and rebirths. That same spirit that comes in and restores is in you. So when you come in, there is restoration. When you come in, there's rebirth. When you come in, come on, there's hope and healing. Why? Because the spirit of God is in you. Not you, but it's the spirit of God that is in you. We have to understand that. God empowers us to do these things. A force, a force moved over the deep. And then finally, the Holy Spirit helps you. We know this. The Holy Spirit's desire and purpose to help you to know how to pray, to guide your steps, to give you the words to speak, to open uh, people to you and so you can share the gospel of truth. And he's going to give you divine appointments. We're going to talk about that next week. But the Holy Spirit helps you. Back in John 14, when Jesus said, I will pray the Father, we just read it. He will give you another help that he may abide with you forever. Watch this, the spirit of truth the, whom the world cannot receive. This is, I, I, don't, I don't have time to get into it, but this is what I'm talking about when I say, we, you know, we want, uh, uh, we, we feel like all, all we need is revival. We do need a revival, but what we need is our life now to reflect what happened out of the revival. That's all I'm saying. We need the revival. We need the signs and wonders, but our life on an everyday basis has to reflect. There must be evidence in us of love, of, of joy and peace and long suffering. There must be evidence in us of all of these things, okay? And the, so the world can't receive that, but it can receive the fruit, okay? Uh, Jesus said, because it neither sees him or knows him, but you know him. For he dwells with you and will be in you. He said, I will not leave you orphans. Come on. I will come to you. So he gives that to us. We have the Holy Spirit in us and are filled with the Holy Spirit, overflowing so we can be free from limitations, so we can be energized with the power of the Spirit. We can be used by God to see people's lives changed through divine appointments. That's why the Holy Spirit is in us. I want to tell you this morning that you shouldn't have to worry. You shouldn't have to have fear. It's, it, that is, listen, that, that is something that comes, but our faith must be something that overcomes our fear. Why? Because we realize we have the Holy Spirit. We have the Holy Spirit. And guess what? The Lord is that Spirit. The Lord is that Spirit. So wherever we go as the church, wherever we are, whatever situation we're in, let us always remember that God's Spirit is in us. God's Spirit is filling us. God's Spirit is with us. God's Spirit is empowering us. God's Spirit is energizing us. And God's Spirit is helping us. We are overcomers. We are more than conquerors. Yes, like he told Israel, we are the head and not the tail. We just don't live it out. And there must be evidence in our life of those things. There must be evidence. And sometimes that evidence looks like being in the midst of a storm and being able to walk on water. Doesn't mean there's no storms in your life. Doesn't mean there aren't things that, that, that don't go wrong in your life. It just means in the midst of all of those things, you're still moving forward and you're not fretting about the circumstances that are all around. Your perspective changes. You're not looking outside and saying, boy, it's a gloomy, doomy day, uh, cloudy and full of rain. You're looking and saying, boy, whoo, something is about to start growing because the rain is coming. The rain is coming down and, and boy, something's about to start growing. I can't wait to see what God does in my life. That's what we have to remember, church.